<laughs> I'm really excited to be here uh, today, guys, and thank you, Britt. Um, I'm excited to be here to present the climate and drought recap for today. Um, we've had some unseasonably dry weather in the last month uh, across the Pacific Northwest, as I'm sure you guys can all attest to. Um, I can attest to that here in, Miz in Missoula, Montana. Um, as a glimmer of hope, it rained here in Missoula last night. Um, not a significant amount of rain, but uh, I hope this continues, although I think Ryan will probably highlight that the odds are tilted towards uh, that not being the case in our, our seasonal outlook. Um, just to highlight an agenda for my climate recap today, uh, my presentation is going to focus on how the conditions we've experienced in the last couple of months compares to our historical conditions. Um, specifically, I'm going to focus on uh, our water year precipitation. So from March, or excuse me, October of 2020 through March of 2021, or last month, uh, our precipitation and temperature rankings, um, as well as the precipitation and temperature trends that we've experienced over the last 60 and 30 days. Um, as I've mentioned, we've seen an intensification of our dry spell in the last 60 and 30 day time periods, uh, and that's continued up through this week. Um, from there, I'll segue and discuss the implications of our uh, both snowpack uh, and precipitation for our soil moisture supply, our stream flow amounts um, as they occur across the basin snowpack, and then finally wrap this up with where we stand in terms of our current drought conditions and some of the impacts that we're experiencing across the region. Uh, I'm going to attempt to do all of this in the next 12 minutes, and then I'll hand it off to Ryan for a discussion of our seasonal outlook. Okay. So let's start by taking a look at our temperature and precipitation anomalies for the water year so far. Um, so the current water year, just to define that, it's the period extending from last October to the end of March of this year. So we haven't completed a full water year yet. Uh, in the figures, conditions from October 2020 to March of this year are compared to those for the same time periods uh, between the period from 1981 to 2010. This figure on the left-hand side shows the anomaly in temperatures across uh, from the Westwide Drought Tracker. Um, anomalously warm areas are indicated by red shading. Normal conditions are represented by white shading, and cooler conditions are represented by blue shading. Um, generally, what you can see here is that temperatures for the majority of the inland um, portions of the Pacific Northwest have been warmer than normal. Uh, these range from about 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit above normal to upwards of 2 degrees uh, above normal in portions of central Washington, southern Idaho, and northwestern Montana. Temperatures along the coast of Oregon and Washington have been near normal for the water year as a whole. In terms of temperature rankings, uh, based upon the last 126 years of record, uh, this has been Montana's 21st warmest year, Idaho's 24th warmest year, Oregon's 16th warmest year, and Washington's 22nd warmest water year. Um, and I should say that's the water year, not the, uh, the calendar year. Um, moving over to the figure on the right, this shows water year precipitation anomalies thus far. Um, here, wet areas are indicated by blue to green shading. Normal precipitation amounts are represented by white shading, and dry conditions are represented by red shading. Generally, uh, there's a north to south gradient in precipitation um, that trends across the region. Uh, the majority of Oregon is experienced, as we know, uh, much below normal water year precipitation, and this has ranged from about 30 to 50% of normal. Um, importantly, this dry trend extends into northeastern Washington, uh, upwards and northerly into northeastern Washington. Um, additionally, southern Idaho has experienced pretty dry conditions, with some portions receiving only 30 to 50 percent of water year precipitation so far. Looking further north, uh, portions of northwestern Washington and northwestern Montana have experienced normal to above normal precipitation, uh, and these areas tend to coincide with uh, decent spring snowpacks, as I'll show you guys in a couple of slides. In terms of precipitation rankings, this has been Montana's 34th driest year. Idaho's 19th driest year, Oregon's 35th driest year, and Washington is near normal with its 68th driest year. Okay, so moving on, and um, a major trend that I really want to highlight in this climate recap is that we've seen an intensification of dryness since the end of February, and especially over the last 60 days across the region. Um, importantly, this, this is important for um, in terms of the implications for our spring soil moisture going into the summertime 
and our, our potential for increased drought development and the impacts that we're already starting to see across the region. So let's move forward into what we've experienced in the last couple of months. On this slide and on the left, um, I've shown the temperature departure from the mean for the last 60 days. Temperatures from this window of time are compared across the period, same time period uh, from 1981 to 2010. Here, white values indicate near normal temperatures. White to blue shading represents colder than normal temperatures, and red, red shading indicates warmer than normal temperatures. Generally, uh, Oregon's experienced near normal to slightly below normal temperatures, with the exception of some warmer pockets in the areas near the coast. Below normal temperatures extended into southern Idaho with ranges from one to three degrees below normal for the last 60 days. In Washington, a swath of warmth has extended northerly above along the leeward side of the Cascades with temperatures ranging from one to two degrees above normal. This swath of warm temperatures has also extended across northern Idaho and into northwestern Montana. In terms of uh, rankings for the last 126 years, March um, and for March uh, independently, so not across a 60 day time period, but for, for the month of March alone, uh, March was the 10th warmest on record for Montana the 36th warmest for Idaho, 46th warmest for Oregon, and 30, 37th or near normal for Washington. Um, importantly, and probably what most of your eyes are gravitating towards is the figure on the right. Uh, the big story here is the anomalously low precipitation amounts. Um, so this figure on the right shows our anomalies in precipitation for the last 60 days. Increasingly brown areas represent uh, below normal precipitation, white areas would represent normal precipitation and green areas, if there were any, uh, would represent above normal precipitation. I'll call your attention to the area of dark brown extending from Oregon to Washington um, along the leeward side of the Cascades. Here, precipitation has been only about 30 to 50 percent of normal for the last 60 days. Uh, the rest of the region is not better, much better off um, with values ranging from 50 to 80 percent of normal precipitation in the last 60 day time period. Um, what this translates to in terms of uh, rankings, um, we actually set some uh, records in a few of the states. Um, for Montana as a whole, so not just Western Montana, but the state of Montana as a whole, it's experienced its second driest March on record. Idaho recorded the 11th driest March on record. Oregon and Washington saw their 13th driest marches on record. Um, so it's shaping up to be a pretty dry spring uh, going into the summertime itself. And just to kind of um, further highlight that trend, as we transition to the last 30 days, um, this next slide shows the, um, the both temperature anomalies as well as precipitation anomalies over the last 30 day time period um, extending through yesterday. Um, we see an intensification of that trend that I just discussed at the 60 day time period. Uh, and importantly, we've seen a series of upper level circulation over the contiguous U.S. Um, over the last couple of weeks, and it's consisted of a series of ridges over the West Coast. These have blocked Pacific moisture from entering Oregon and Washington and kept the West Coast warmer than normal. Um, the adjacent trough uh, has funneled some cold and dry Canadian air into the plains of Montana and portions of the panhandle uh, in I Idaho itself. So on the left, kind of reflecting these trends, um, temperatures have generally been two to four degrees warmer along the coast and windward side of the Cascades in Washington and Oregon. On the leeward side of the Cascades and in Idaho, temperatures trend from normal to two to three degrees below normal as you progress further into Montana. And that's associated with uh, a trough and cooler air coming out of Canada. Um, moving to the right, precipitation deficits have become worse over the last 30 days. Um, what we've seen is a spread of that dark brown area. Uh, the area below normal conditions now extends across the majority of the Pacific Northwest with precipitation at um, or between 30 to 50 percent of normal um, over the last 30 days. Um, I didn't include it in the presentation today, but this trend has continued over the last seven days, uh, except some pockets of significant moisture in uh, northeastern Washington. Um, importantly, some moisture has occurred in Klamath Falls around the drought-stricken D3 and D4 areas around Klamath Falls. Um, and then we've seen some precipitation recently in northwestern Montana. Importantly, you can track these conditions by going to the climate toolkit link that I provided on this slide. Okay, so moving on to snowpack, um, let's talk a little bit about where we stand in terms of snowpack conditions uh, for this spring. 
Um, importantly, snowpack is a key indicator that foreshadows anticipated drought conditions moving from the spring and importantly into the summer. I've shown the percent of average snow water equivalent for April 25th uh, across the mountainous regions of the Pacific Northwest. Um, these data are measured from snow water equivalents at snow pillow sites uh, across the Rocky Mountains and the Cascades. You can think of um, snow water equivalent as the amount of water that would exist as a depth of water if we were to melt the entire snowpack at a given location. So in this figure, I've shown the median snowpack snow water equivalent or SWE conditions uh, for the hydrologic unit code or HUC6 watersheds across the region. Orange shading indicates below normal snowpack conditions on average. So this is averaging uh, gauge stations across a given basin. Uh, white indicates normal conditions and green indicates above normal conditions. Um, as you look across this, we see a general trend. Basins in Montana and Idaho, west of the Rocky Mountain Divide, are generally between 85 to upwards of 100% of normal for the 30-year median at this time of the year. Um, I should highlight that most of these snow tail sites have reached isothermal snowpack conditions with snowmelt beginning. Uh, this is about a week early, depending upon uh, the, a certain location, but we are seeing the initiation of snowmelt in most of these locations. In the Cascades of northern Washington, conditions are wet with snowpack SWE equivalents ranging from 100 up to upwards of about 175% of the normal median SWE. So this is a good thing, very wet conditions uh, in these areas. And, Northern Washington, um, and but further south, uh, deficits and SWE exist across the majority of Oregon and Southern Idaho. Importantly, the majority of these sites accumulated lower than normal snowpack during the winter, uh, and snowmelt is initiated across this region between one to two weeks earlier than normal. Um, so this early melt onset has contributed to much below normal SWE, ranging from 50 to uh, less than 25% of normal um, for the major basins in the Southern portions of Oregon and Idaho. Um, so taken as a whole, the conditions in Oregon and Idaho are pretty worrisome for soil moisture, fuel moisture, and groundwater recharge moving into the spring. Um, we're going to need to play catch up with precipitation in the upcoming months uh, to reach, recharge our depleted soil water stores and sustain stream flows in the upcoming summer. Okay, so I just wanted to take a broader look at soil moisture and our trends and spatial trends in soil moisture across the region. Um, the drought conditions coming out of the fall, as well as the lack of recent precipitation, have set the stage for our uh, soil moisture conditions. Um, importantly, soil moisture is factored into forecasts as an indicator of wet or dry basin conditions and the potential for drought as we move into the summer. In this slide, I've shown the Climate Prediction Center's uh, modeled soil moisture anomaly for April 24th. Um, and deficits in soil moisture um, from roughly negative 20 to negative 120 millimeters are indicated with light orange to progressively red shading, indicating increasing deficits. Um, really areas in the whole area uh, or the whole region is highlighted here as a deficit, but areas that stand out in terms of large soil moisture deficits include Southern Oregon at upwards of 140 millimeters of soil water deficit. Um, from Southern Oregon, a swath of below normal soil moisture extends outward and upward across the majority of the region. Idaho is also notable uh, with deficits from negative 60 to upwards of negative 100 uh, extending up through its panhandle. Okay, looking directly at the kind of the implications of both our soil moisture and our, our snowpack conditions across the region, um, looking directly at current stream flow conditions, here's a map of USGS uh, stream gauges and flow rankings across the Pacific Northwest for the past week. Uh, across the, na the gauge network, blue symbols indicate greater than 90th percentile flows or above normal flow conditions uh, for the time period. Light blue is between 76th to 90th percentiles. Green uh, is the 25th to 70th percentile and orange indicating uh, below normal conditions is the 10th to 24th percentile. Um, one thing to note here on this map is that some gauges currently appear on the map without shading. Um, this is due to frozen stilling wells and river conditions at the at a particular gauge site, especially at our some of our high elevation sites. Um, generally, the big story here as you look at this map is the vast number of streams um, and and river conditions um, along Oregon and Washington coasts that are experiencing below normal to much below normal flows. Uh, these are associated with the drought conditions from last summer and fall, continued lack of 
fall and winter recharge, um, and it's led to depleted soil moisture and groundwater stores, um, so reduction in those stream base flows. Generally, uh, the majority of gauges across Washington on the leeward side of the Cascades are reporting normal to above normal stream flow. A lot of these instances are associated with uh, earlier snowmelt and the rising limb of the stream hydrographs um, in terms of occur their occurring uh, uh, slightly earlier than normal. There are numerous gauges in the panhandle of northern Idaho and southern Idaho, as well as western Montana, uh, that are below average. And these conditions are related to the lack of precipitation this winter and dry conditions from last uh, summer and fall. Hey, Kelsey, can you, um, sorry to interrupt, but wrap it up pretty quickly here, okay? Sure, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Brett, I'm taking too long. <laughs> well, I, I think I can sum it all up with the current map, the U.S. Drought Monitor, um, summing all of these observations up. Uh, this is the map drawn by Richard Heim this week from NOAA as NCEI. Um, and generally, low stream flow, dry soils, and precipitation deficits over the last three months have prompted expansion of abnormal dryness and drought all along the West Coast. In Washington, D0 expanded to the coast and D1 spread northeastward with only above normal snow water content and water year to date precipitation, keeping the Olympics and Cascades free of abnormal dryness. Uh, D1 and D0 spread across northern Idaho and into northwest Montana, and D1 and D2 expanded in western and northeastern Oregon. And I'll wrap it up in a sec, Britt. I, I just want to highlight some impacts. Um, in terms of the impacts associated with the drought conditions, the Klamath project is going to receive about 33,000 acre feet of water in 2021, and this is about a tenth of uh, the average amount, so the lowest allocation in the project's history. Uh, dust storms have been reported recently in Oregon and eastern Washington, um, and according to USDA reports, percentage of topsoil moisture short or very short jumped this week to 65% of the area in Oregon, 60% of the areas in Washington, and importantly, sparse amounts of rains uh, this, this spring uh, have contributed to poor growth of annual grasses, and producers in Montana, Idaho, and Oregon, and Washington are beginning to think about shipping cattle um, due to potential lack of feed. And I'll just leave this summary slide. Sorry, Britt. No worries. Thank you, Kelsey, so much. Great information. Um, and we'll go ahead and uh, move on to um, Ryan Lucas, who will be talking about the outlook. And I am giving you presentation control now. Thank you, Kelsey. All right, are you seeing my screen? Sorry, yes. I was muted. I am, and just yeah, okay. go to presentation mode, and we should okay. be good. Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Kelsey, for uh, your presentation. It's a great lead into uh, mine here. So, uh, my name is Ryan Lucas. I'm with the uh, Northwest River Forecast Center uh, in Portland, Oregon, um, as part of the National Weather Service. And I'm going to talk a little bit about current conditions and uh, a little bit about our climate outlook as well. Uh, this will come largely in a sort of a uh, sorry, I'm getting my cat on my lap here as a function of uh, perspective from water supply and what we do in our office. Um, so just my take home message is, is that uh, since the, the last bi-monthly dues uh, webinar has been, we've had a dry March and April bringing seasonal precip down as, as uh, Kelsey mentioned. Uh, so as of now, with few exceptions, our water year to date precipitation is below normal across our domain. Um, March and April were poor snow building months and snow melt is well underway in, in the southern domain and, and lower, uh, lower elevations. And our uh, water supply forecast for our April to September uh, period are, are near normal in some areas, but mostly below normal across the basin with some uh, exceptionally low uh, volume forecast uh, in the southern part of our domain. Uh, so this is uh, a bit of a, a rehash of some of the temperature and precipitation anomalies that, that Kelsey presented. But this is our, our domain at the Northwest River Forecast Center. Um, I will point out that the Klamath River Basin is in the uh, California Nevada River Forecast Center domain. So it's not on these maps, but uh, the trends there are similar to the basins sort of surrounding it where uh, in, in 
if we have time at the end, I can highlight some of the, the graphics from the California Nevada RFC. All right, so looking at temperature departure, and uh, these shape files on these maps are, or these polygons are our river forecast points. Um, and so these values are a mean aerial value for these, these basins on these maps. So March was, was pretty cool for most of the basin. And, and as April has progressed, it's become uh, anomalously warm as seen by the, the sort of pinkish and red uh, colors there in the in Oregon, uh, central and eastern Washington, and, and southwestern Idaho. Uh, I won't spend too much time on these since Kelsey did such a good job of, of covering these um, anomalies for the last 60 days. So this is precipitation with March on the left and April on the right, uh, red being below 50% of normal uh, for those months. And again, I'll skip through this and, and uh, sort of show what that means to date. So at the end of February is, is what seasonal precipitation for the water year. So since October 1st through the end of February, that's the graphic on the left, uh, with greens being, or so that light green color being 90 to 110%, so something sort of in the normal range, darker greens being above normal and, and blues being well above normal. And then yellows and oranges and reds uh, being uh, below normal with uh, red being the most severe, less than 50% of normal precipitation. So that's what our map looked like on the left at the end of February after two dry months and a warm end of, of April. Uh, a lot of those sort of green colors have, have transitioned into yellows and oranges and we've seen this growing red of less than 50% of precipitation and, and sort of South Central, Southeastern Oregon um, and parts of Idaho and Central Idaho. And then uh, there's this, uh, I don't know if you folks can see my mouse, but in sort of Central Idaho, there are these, these four smallish basins here showing this below 50% below normal. That's the Big and Little Lost and Wood, or Big and Little Wood and Lost River basins uh, that are sort of this have had this persistent uh, dry spot on whether it be precipitation or snowpack, soil moisture. Uh, those, those basins have, have been dry for quite some time. I think the last time those basins have seen normal precipitation was uh, sometime in water year 2019. Um, all right, so uh, moving on to snowpack here. Uh, again, this is sort of our, from our the end of April beginning of, or the end of February beginning of March on the left. This is the snow water equivalent at these uh, NRCS as well as uh, British Columbia and, and Alberta snow pillows. Uh, and again, so after dry March, dry April, warm end of April, we've seen this transition and these numbers are percent of normal uh, for, for that time of year. So you know, pretty good looking snowpack in, in Eastern Washington or Western Washington up into Canada the Blue and Wallowa Mountains in, in Northeastern Oregon, um, Central Idaho, uh, up into the, the Pend Oreille, Clark Fork Rivers uh, in Western Montana. Uh, but as the months, uh, last two months were dry and, and have become relatively warm in the last uh, couple of few weeks of April, a lot of that has moved these sort of blue and green values into the, the yellow, orange, and red, especially in, in the Southern part of our basin. Um, in the Snake River and, and in Oregon. And just a, a highlight of, of what a couple of these uh, snow water equivalent graphics have looked like over time. So on the top is Lookout Pass um, and see it's sort of starting to turn over the black line being the, the observed values with the, the green lines being the, the average um, or the median uh, depending on which green line you're looking at. And so this is starting to turn over in the northern part of our basin, uh, looking like either we're at near peak SWE or, or a little bit past it and, and snow starting to come off. And I wanted to highlight this Beaver Reservoir snow tail here on the bottom. This is up in the uh, in northeastern Oregon where it had a real healthy snowpack. As you can see at the, the beginning of April, something like 15 inches of SWE, so 150, 160% of normal uh, a month ago, and then uh, warm and dry and just seeing that melt out pretty quick and that's down to um, you know just above normal for this time of year. 
All right, so what does that mean? Observed conditions, this is our adjusted natural runoff as a percent of normal uh, for uh, as of yesterday afternoon. Um, and so this sort of follows all of these precipitation, snow, temperature trends that, that Ken Lee highlighted and I've tried to expand on here. So lower than the normal observed runoff, southwestern Oregon, all of eastern Oregon, much of the Snake River Basin in, in southern Idaho, um, and even up into to northeastern Washington and northern Idaho. Uh, a near to normal runoff in uh, northwestern Washington. Um, I'm going to move on so I, I don't run out of time before I get to some of these things here. All right, so moving forward, looking at, at our outlook, this is uh, our 10 day precipitation forecast values on the left. Um, and then a deviation from what is normal for the next 10 days on the right um, in values. So although there's precipitation in our forecast over the next 10 days, it's really less than, than what we would anticipate as normal for this time of year um, for much of the basin. So what does that mean as far as water supply volume forecasts? So I'm showing um, our April to September natural volume forecasts. Um, as a percent of normal on the left. Uh, so, you know, lots of oranges and reds showing below normal uh, water supply volume forecasts. And if I rank that, um, given our uh, going back as far as 1949 of observed runoff from April to September for each of these points, uh, that's what I'm showing on the right. So, a lot of single digits um, and sort of in, you can see in south. Uh, central Idaho here, these these two ones and the the uh, big wood and little wood basins and, and big loss basins showing you know the driest water supply volume forecast for April to September period that, that uh, 72 period of record. Lots of ones and twos and single digits in, in Western Oregon as well. Um, I will highlight that a lot of the runoff for Western Oregon um, occurs, majority of it occurs before this April to September window. Um, okay, and then I just want to point out that this is our, these are these volume forecasts as they evolve over the course of the season. So this is this um, April to September volume forecast starting on October 1st, uh, and then what that volume forecast evolves as through over the course of the season. And these box plots show uh, the range of our ensembles um, for each day as, as we move this forward. So, you know, at the end of February, you know, we were at, at the big lost um, at Howell Ranch, we were up here in about 109,000 acre feet. And since the end of February, um, it's just continued to decrease as we've seen this lack of precipitation and warm temperatures. Um, so you can go and click on this for any of our sites. And then I'll just highlight some of these tabs on the, on the top up here. Um, I mean, looking at something like you can sh uh, look at this forecast as a function of what that volume is forecast for any given month, uh, with these blue bars being the observed values and then the box plots being the, the ensemble spread for that given month in our forecast period. Um, and then I'm not touching much on the uh, El Nino, La Nina forecast in my presentation today because by this time of year, um, it has uh, really very little influence on, on what we would expect uh, for our April to September volume forecast. And so what I have plotted here from our website is each of these numbers is, is, the, is that given year and on the y-axis is the observed runoff for that year. And it's plotted against the, the El Nino La Nina um, index on the, on the bottom on the x-axis here. So La Nina years being more towards the left, El Nino years being more towards the right, and this blue line is, is the trend line. Um, and so you can see there's not much of a trend line for this is for the big loss at Hell Ranch, um, given this uh, May, June, July El Nino index or El Nino La Nina index. Um, but you can go to these sites and you can play with any given period and different uh, uh, telekinetic uh, indices different runoff periods, select your water year range. Um, I encourage you to do that. And then I'm just gonna touch on the uh, the Climate Prediction Center three month outlook. This was created on April 15th. 
so this is valid for May, June, and July, with the temperature being on the left and most of the Pacific Northwest being uh, looking for above normal temperature anomaly with equal chance of above, below, or near normal conditions uh, or temperatures. And then below normal precipitation uh, across our entire domain for uh, is, is the trend for May, June, and July. Uh, I will also just uh, highlight that our uh, next water supply briefing from, from the Northwest River Forecast Center is a week from Thursday. Um, so feel free to sign up for that. Uh, and I didn't provide a link here, but I, I can be sure to provide that as well. My take home messages again, I'll leave them there and then I will uh, yield. And if there are time for questions, I'm happy to answer those, but I have the sense that it's also time to move on. So thank you for your <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Um, we will move on to Erica, though we are getting some questions in the chat box and we're trying to answer them as we go, so no worries. Um, Erica, I will turn it over to you. Terrific. I, since I can see my screen, I'm guessing that everyone else can see my screen. Is that the case? Yep, it looks good. Great. All right, and I, um, because some of what I was planning to discuss other people have touched on, I will try to buy us some collective time um, for this hour that we all have together. All right, um, I am director of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, and Brett, uh, Brett did a terrific job of introducing us, so there's not much more that I'm going to say. We were established by the Oregon legislature about 15 years ago, and we are housed at Oregon State University, but we are not a wholly owned subsidiary of Oregon State University. We are very fortunate to have a network that extends across Oregon's public universities and to have numerous public and private partners at the state and federal levels and obviously outside of government. And we are home of the Oregon Climate Service, which is where Oregon State Climatologist um, is based. And so right now our state climatologist is Larry O'Neill, and it is an absolute pleasure to be able to work with him on a regular basis. Um, I think that Brett covered very well what we do, so I'm gonna skip past that. If you are interested in learning more, we have a website. Um, Oregon Climate Assessments. We do these every other year. This is one of our um, obligations that we are very happy to meet that was set up by the legislature when they established OCRI. These are peer-reviewed assessments and our charge is to evaluate the state of climate change science as applicable to Oregon and the likely effects of climate change on the state. To the greatest extent possible, it is in non-technical language, but we have some technical details that uh, many researchers often are able to, um, to build on in other ways. So this assessment was in, in one way distinct from our past assessments. We had the opportunity to produce it in partnership with the Oregon Climate Change Adaptation Framework, which was released a couple of months ago it was spearheaded or is still being spearheaded by the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development and 20 some agencies or um, people affiliated with 20 some agencies work together on this framework. It is very strongly aligned with equity goals that we've seen at state and regional and national levels. And this uh, state climate change adaptation framework is part of Oregon's natural hazard mitigation plan, which allows the state to access uh, funds for preparedness and adaptation from the federal government. So we also had a strong emphasis on equity in this, um, in this fifth Oregon climate assessment. One thing I'll mention is that um, there are data suggesting that households that spend 30% or more 30% or more of their income on rent or a mortgage tend to be more affected by extreme events. And in Oregon, that is 50% of our residents. So the design of the fifth Oregon climate assessment, uh, we had a section on state of climate science, and I will address that a little bit today. We talked about different natural hazards, um, and then we focused on the effects of climate and natural hazards on these adaptation sectors, which also were the focus of the Oregon Climate Change Adaptation Framework. Um, for various reasons, we did not break out economy 
um, as one of the adaptation sectors. We're planning to do that in the sixth Oregon Climate Assessment, but economics are touched on um, in the different sections uh, that, that do appear in the document. So the, um, the sections that we have on climate science, they cover fairly familiar ground to this group. Um, we deal with both what has been observed and what has been projected. In this case, um, and there's, there's a reason I'm mentioning this, we uh, worked with the CMIP-5 models, basically the generation of global climate models that most people have been working with in recent years and are quite well understood by the climate science community and by the climate adaptation community. Um, so guess what? It's getting warmer. Um, the bottom line on this within Oregon, it has warmed throughout the year. Um, the greatest increases are in summer. By whatever standard or threshold you call something hot, um, we're getting more hot days and it's hotter on those days. And in a relative sense, it's warmer at night than, um, than during the day. Precipitation, largely the same thing. Um, the take home message here is that precipitation in Oregon total, what are your precipitation, um, is stable or even increasing somewhat. But as this group knows well, that doesn't mean that we have equal access to that water. Um, so we are seeing more precipitation in winter and less in summer, heavier winter storms and much more precipitation coming as rain than as snow. One thing I wanted to mention, and I'm going to cover this um, quite quickly, is that we started getting into looking at the difference between the, the current generation of climate models, CMIP-5, and the next generation, CMIP-6 and looking at different sensitivities there. Um, I would welcome people's comments on the extent to which they are interested in, not in this webinar, but in general, having access to, um, to information on the differences in CMIP-5 and CMIP-6, given that the uh, qualitative directions that, um, that Oregon and the Pacific Northwest are headed have not, have not changed that much. Um, so we had a really nice analysis of trends in Oregon snowpack, and this was done by um, Ben Hatchett at Desert Research Institute in Reno. So old news that snow water equivalent has decreased quite a bit in recent decades. Um, new news were some projections for, um, for that period of time, um, and those are somewhat experimental. We have uncertainties associated with those projections. Um, and there were a number of different metrics that were addressed here, um, snow water equivalent, days with snow cover, and um, snow, snow sufficient for recreation, be that um, overland travel or skiing or what have you. Um, so snow water equivalent, again, this is from Ben Hatchett's analysis, um, snow water equivalent is declining quite a bit on the east side of the central Cascades and also on the west side of the Cascades. Um, across the region, there's not really anywhere where it's increased. Snow melt is, or um, peak snow water equivalent, is advancing several days to, um, to up to 10 days per decade. And the onset of having sufficient snow for recreation is, um, is being delayed by up to um, eight days per decade, depending exactly where you are in Oregon. Um, all of this is Oregon specific because it was the Oregon climate assessment, but many of these trends are um, consistent across much of the Northwest. One thing that we did in this assessment was to go through um, the different types of drought. I'm not going to go through that today. Fortunately, there is a document that you can reference for more information on all of this. But what we tried to do is just to tease apart when people say, well, how are you defining drought? What does it all mean? Um, it means lots of different things to lots of different people, and there are different ways of measuring it. And so we tried to provide some guidance on what that means. Um, flash drought, what does that mean? So walking through a lot of this so that there's um, an ability for, for anyone to have a better understanding of what is meant by, um, by drought and also what does that mean for different sectors that um, rely on water. So I wanted to mention a couple things that I thought I found fairly interesting related to how drought intersects with the built environment. This is work that was led by Alexandra Rempel and Meghna Babar Sevens. Um, so electricity in the Northwest. The, the Western United States um, has a connected electric grid that spans across the entire region. Um, this was not something that, that I was aware of. So there's a really nice section explaining um, how electricity is networked across the region. In general, the Northwest um, exports to California. And the system on the whole is pretty resilient, but drought and other extremes do affect um, the grid as a whole. 
So um, drought, bottom line, drought is likely to increase production, increase prices both for production and supply. So in wet years, the Northwest and Northern California, and these regions are um, regions as identified in the Western interconnection in the grid. They're not, they're not my terms for these regions. In wet years, the Northwest exports to Southern California, which then becomes less dependent on the desert Southwest. Um, in dry years, the desert Southwest expands production and the Northwest is less of a producer. So there are ramifications um, throughout the grid for drought, although electricity across the region is not threatened per se. It's more a matter of pricing and fluctuations in supply and demand. The electric grid as a whole is fairly stable in the Northwest. Um, one thing that is a, a digression, but I think it's quite interesting, is that um, electric vehicles in Oregon, as the state adapt, adopts more um, electric vehicles and has incentives for this, um, initially, if everyone tomorrow magically had an electric vehicle, um, peak loads are likely to go up. And that is in large part because let's pretend it's not pandemic times. If lots of people commute to work and then come home roughly around the same time and plug in their vehicles, you get a spike in load. Um, a lot of this can be managed with um, setting up charging stations elsewhere and having time dependent um, fees for charging, as we've seen many of us in other aspects of our um, electric utility pricing. So um, lots of potential for mitigation of those peaks as electric sources change. Um, the assessment can be found here. And if that is not something you can remember, you all have excellent Google skills and can just type in Ocri OSU and you will come to our website. It is not too complicated. The assessment is under publications and it's a free download. Um, and that is your whirlwind tour of the fifth word in climate assessment. Great. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, we will go to our last presenter now, um, our other Kelsey today, Kelsey Satellino with the NIDAS team, who's going to talk about the new drop.gov. And I'm locating you on the list here. Kelsey, give me one second. Thank you. Okay, should be coming your way. I'm assuming y'all can see my screen unless someone tells me otherwise. Um, You're good. Great. So as Britt said, I'm Kelsey. I'm with the National Integrated Drought Information System, or NIDIS. And very recently, NIDIS worked with NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information to launch a brand new redesign of the U.S. Drought Portal, or drought.gov, which you can see on my screen here. And so today, I just want to give you a very high-level overview of some of the key new features of the new drought.gov, which could be useful for you. So this is also going to be a bit of a, a whirlwind tour of this website. Um, the, the overall goal of the new website is to create um, improved usability and accessibility, um, updated content featuring maps and data from a variety of our partners all in one place, and new interactive and easily shareable maps to make finding and sharing drought information easier than ever. So the first key feature that I want to highlight for you today um, is the ability to view drought information at a higher resolution down to the city and county level. So either by visiting the by location section of our website, where you can view drought information at a variety of geographic scales, or by visiting the homepage, a user can type in their city, zip code, or county, and immediately be taken to a page that shows up-to-date drought information down to the city and county level. The maps, graphs, and charts on these pages are interactive and are updated automatically with the latest available information. And again, we're bringing in uh, information from a variety of partners um, all into one integrated place. Um, these pages contain information on current conditions, including precipitation and temperature, key indicators of drought, drought blends, future conditions and outlooks, and historical drought information down to the county level. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about historical drought information on drought.gov shortly, so I won't go into detail here. Uh, jumping up to the county level, so this was the location page for Eugene, Oregon, so I can jump up to Lane County, Oregon. The county level pages on drought.gov contain a lot of the same up-to-date drought information, data and maps on historical information, current conditions, and outlooks. However, there are a couple of key additions on the county level pages. Throughout drought.gov, you'll notice these blue boxes or blue bars with gold statistics 
Um, these are key takeaways, high-level statistics that we've included throughout drought.gov to help you tell the story of drought in your region or in a particular economic sector, comparing current conditions to previous conditions. Um, for example, we can see that February was the 48th wettest February over the past 127 years for Lane County, Oregon, uh, with uh, precipitation 0.74 inches above normal. In addition to a lot of the same uh, maps that are on the local pages, including current conditions, outlooks, and historical conditions, these county level pages also contain maps showing the impacts of drought on different economic sectors, including agriculture, with crop and livestock data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture overlaid on top of the current U.S. Drought Monitor, water supply information, including precipitation outlooks from the Climate Prediction Center, and stream flow information from the US Geological Survey. And this map is interactive. All of these maps, you can zoom in or out, click a different county to view that county's drought information, or click on a particular stream gauge in this instance to go to the US Geological Survey webpage for that particular stream gauge and view more information. And then finally, we also display public health information including the Center for Disease Control and Prevention Social Vulnerability Index, which uses census variables to help officials identify communities that may need support in preparing for or recovering from hazards like drought, as well as wildfire information and heat warnings and air quality warnings issued by the National Weather Service. Any of these maps are really easy to share by clicking the download a screenshot of this panel link or you can click to learn more about the data to understand exactly where it's coming from and, and in many cases access that data for yourself. I'm just going to jump up to the Oregon State page. I won't spend too long in the by location section of drought.gov. Um, as you can see, um, we have the ability to view drought information at a variety of geographic scales from the city and county level to the state, regional, watershed, national, and even international levels. Our state pages are a key resource for both current conditions, historical conditions at the state level, and uh, key state planning resources and local and regional partners. So each of our state pages contains current and past U.S. drought monitor conditions, as well as this little status bar that will pop up whenever the National Weather Service weather forecast offices in a given state have issued a drought information statement. When that's the case, this bar will turn red and you can click a link to view uh, the drought information statement for that region directly on drought.gov or to view an interactive map of all of the drought information statements that are currently active within the United States. So this is the drought information statement for Pendleton, Oregon. And as you can see, there's an interactive map here where you can view all of the currently active statements from your local weather forecast office. These state pages also contain historical information at the state level upcoming events, including this webinar, uh, related documents, and a curated list of web resources for the state, including state drought agencies or task forces, um, the state's drought plan, if it has one, drought planning resources, a link to Coco Ross, as Britt mentioned earlier, and key state and regional partners like National Weather Service weather forecast offices and river forecast centers. Um, uh, the other key feature of the new drought.gov I want to highlight since I know I'm running low on time here are the interactive data and maps that are present throughout the site where we've brought in information from a variety of partners and tried to make that information really easy to navigate and really easy to share with others. Our historical data and information page, which is within the data and maps section of drought.gov, displays three historical drought data sets side by side, aiming to answer the question, how does this drought compare to past droughts in this region? So we have U.S. drought monitor data going back to the year 2000, a nine-month standardized precipitation index going uh, from NOAA's National Centers for Environmental Information going back to the year 1895, and paleoclimate data from the National Centers for Environmental Information's Living Blended Drought Product, which blends tree ring reconstructions with instrumental data to estimate the average drought conditions each summer going back to the year zero for some regions of the U.S. It's really easy to switch between uh, different data sets, to zoom in on a specific period of time, to move this cursor to select a specific time range, and then the map and statistics will update automatically. You can then view this information at the state level, clicking on a state to load that state's historical drought information, 
and the graph, statistics, and map will update automatically. You can then easily dig in and select a specific county to view that county's drought information. Once you've found what you're looking for, it's really easy to share this information. You can download the data for yourself, download a screenshot of the map or panel for easy sharing, or you can click the share slash embed button at the top right hand corner to share a permalink that will take you directly to this data set, time period, and geographic scale. You can actually also uh, copy this code to embed this entire tool within your own website. So we've, we've tried to make it really easy to use the data and maps on drought.gov and to easily share them. The final thing in my last minute here that I want to touch on really quickly is the brand new by sector section of drought.gov, um, showing drought's impacts on different economic sectors from agriculture to public health to recreation and tourism and more. I want to really, really briefly show you the wildfire management section uh, sector page on drought.gov. Um, each of these pages is meant to be a landing page for resources, showing the impacts of drought on different economic sectors and providing resources for drought early warning. So each of these pages contains a featured map or maps showing the impacts of drought on that sector. For example, this map shows the current US drought monitor overlaid with currently active wildfires, um, according to the National Wildfire Coordinating Group. And we've also got um, a fire weather one day outlook from the National Weather Service on this page. These pages also contain some background information, high level key issues related to drought in that sector, a more in-depth background on drought's impacts on that sector, and a curated list of resources for drought early warning within that sector of the economy. Overall, uh, we designed the new drought.gov to pull information, data, and maps from a variety of NIDIS's partners into one integrated drought portal. So whether you want to explore this information by topic in the data and map section, by economic sector in our by sector section, or by geographic scale within the by location section of drought.gov down to the city and county level. Uh, drought.gov aims to make it easy to help decision makers get the information they need to monitor, prepare for, and mitigate the impacts of drought. Um, and with that, I'll open it up for any questions if we have any time remaining. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so camp. much, Kelsey. <laughs> Um, great speedy overview. Um, so we are out of time and I want to respect everyone's time. So the various speaker contact information is here. Um, my email is very easy to remember, brit.parker at noaa.gov if you have any follow-up questions. I think we um, have just about at addressed everything that came in through the question box in that box um, working with the presenters. So thank you so much um, for your time and for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time on June 28th, um, which is our next webinar. So thank you, everyone.